Hello and welcome to the Katie Helper Show. We have such an amazing show for you tonight. We have two wonderful guests. We're going to be speaking to human rights lawyer Nuda Erekat, as well as Rabbi Yaakov Shapiro. Uh, before we get started on the show, of course, like the stream. This is a way to spread the word about the show. And as I've said before, I think on this issue, especially there's so much misinformation out there. And with guests like the ones I'm having on tonight, it's so important to get their voices out. So please do, if you haven't already, give a thumbs up. That's really easy. Also subscribe, hit subscribe and then the bell. Um, and share this on social media. And of course, if you can become Patreon supporters, you can do that at patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. Again, that's patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. It's literally how we do the show. Thanks to supporters like you. So uh, thank you guys so much for tuning in. I'm going to introduce our first guest, and then I'll bring her on. But um, let me just tell you a little bit about this, our first guest. Really impressive, impressive guest. Nuda Erekat is a human rights attorney, associate professor of Africana Studies, and the program of criminal justice at Rutgers University, New Brunswick. She recently completed a non-resident fellowship of the Religious Literacy Project at Harvard Divinity School and was a Mahmoud Darwish visiting professor in Palestinian studies at Brown University. Nura is the author of Justice for Some, Law and the Question of Palestine, which received the Palestine Book Award and the Bronze Medal for the Independent Publishers Book Award in Current Events, Foreign Affairs. She's co-founding editor of Jadalaya and an editorial board member of the Journal of Palestine Studies, as well as Human Geography. She is a co-founding board member of the DC Palestinian Film and Arts Festival. She has served as legal counsel for a congressional subcommittee in the House of Representatives as legal advocate for the Badil Resource Center for Palestinian Refugees and Residency Rights and as national organizer of the U.S. campaign to end the Israeli occupation. So without further ado, welcome, Nura. Thank you, Katie. Of thank course. Thank you for thank that you. very kind introduction as well. Oh, well, of course. And thank you for joining. I know how busy you are, so I really appreciate the time that you took out of your very busy schedule. Um, I wanted to thank you for everything that you're doing because you're a tireless advocate. And I also wanted to uh, apologize in advance because I'm going to have you react to a clip that's very unpleasant to look at. But I, I thought it would be perfect to start our conversation by looking at a, uh, a clip of John Kirby, um, mm -hmm. who is, of course, the uh, National Security Council spokesperson. John Kirby was asked this week about genocide. So let's take a look and what John Kirby had to say, and then we'll get your thoughts on that. Sure. Uh, protesters here in DC and New York, across the country, uh, they've settled on a nickname for the president. Uh, they've been calling him Genocide Joe. They wrote it on the gates. Um, do you have a response from the White House to that nickname that they've settled on? We're not worried about nicknames and bumper stickers. I mean, uh, it, it's First Amendment, free speech. Um, uh, the president's focused on as he wrote in his op-ed on making sure that we can continue to support Israel as they fight a terrible terrorist group, Hamas, um, and as we all work together to get humanitarian assistance in and get people out, including hostages. Um, I said this the other day, again, people can say what they want on, on the sidewalk and that, that we respect that. That's what the First Amendment's about. But this word genocide is getting thrown around in a pretty inappropriate way by lots of different folks. Uh, what Hamas wants, make no mistake about it, is genocide. They want to wipe Israel off the map. They've said so publicly more than one occasion. In fact, just recently. And they've said that they're not going to stop. What happened on the 7th of October is going to happen again and again and again. And what happened on the 7th of October? Murder, slaughter of innocent people in their homes or at a music festival. That's genocidal intentions. Yes, there are too many civilian casualties in Gaza. Yes, the numbers are too high. Yes, fam too many families are grieving. And yes, we continue to urge the Israelis to be as careful and cautious as possible. That's not going to stop from the president right on down. But Israel is not trying to wipe the Palestinian people off the map. Israel's not trying to wipe Gaza off the map. Israel's trying to defend itself against a genocidal terrorist threat. So when we're going to start, if we're going to start using that word, fine, 
let's use it appropriately. So, yeah, Katie, I don't know where you want to start. I mean, it's really unfortunate that um, John Kirby is representing the National Security Council. One of the things that I've been really eager to do in this moment is to actually be able to have a debate. And, you know, I thought maybe somebody from the NSC who would be able to discuss, you know, rules of engagement, laws of war. Um, but even, I mean, looking at this, are they even well-versed in it, right? It's, it's, it's curious to me whether or not, you know, John Kirby actually knows better, right? right. Or this is, is this in fact just, are these in fact just talking points and propaganda or does he in fact know better? Because everything that he said is, is littered with misinformation, not only misinformation about, and I saw something that you, you know, the mashup that you posted yeah. where you had, mm -hmm. you let Israelis speak for themselves Yeah, where he says, you know, Israel is not, doesn't want to wipe uh, Gaza off the map. Israel doesn't want right. to uh, wipe Palestinians off the map. Israel doesn't want to remove Palestinians in order to replace them with settlers as it's been doing systematically for 75 years. Right. Um, yeah. and, but then there's also, then there's the matter of law. So I, I I hear you saying that you're gonna show your own mashup. So sure, I'll let, yeah, let's I'll do, let should we yeah, should we do that and then we can hear your human rights lawyer um analysis of everything. Okay. This word genocide's getting thrown around in a pretty inappropriate way by lots of different folks. Israel is not trying to wipe the Palestinian people off the map. It's an entire nation out there that is responsible. It's not true. This rhetoric about civilians not where we're not aware, not involved, it's absolutely not true. Israel's not trying to wipe Gaza off the map. In Hashmal, in Mazon, in Maim, in Delik. Akol Sago. Nachmunir Hamim Bechayot Adam. Vanachmu Nuagim Bechayot Adam. Hazelot Akzor Yot Mashal. Hazelot Hamas Noyot. Hazel Takol. Israel is trying to defend itself against a genocidal terrorist threat. So when we're going to start, if we're going to start using that word, fine, let's use it appropriately. Yeah. So it speaks for, I mean, the, the genocidal leaders speak for themselves. But I, I wanted to ask you, I, I interviewed um, Craig McIver the other day, who is also a human rights lawyer, who, as people know, resigned from the UN precisely over its failure to um, protect or speak out on behalf of Palestinians. Uh, and he said one of the things with genocide is that often the hardest part of proving genocide is you have to establish the genocidal intent. But that with Israel, um, they're, they are so used to impunity that they're actually saying the, the quiet parts out loud. So can you talk, given the, given the fact that John Kirby very condescendingly and either ignorantly or dishonestly is pretending that uh, genocide is not happening and then it's irresponsible to call what's happening genocide, can you just uh, share with the audience what the legal definition of genocide is? Sure. Why don't we start there? Um, by just, so 1948, genocide is prescribed in an international treaty that defines it as the destruction of a people in whole or in part based on their racial, ethnic, national, or religious grounds. Um, it comes on the heels of um, genocide of Jewish people um, at the hands of the Third Reich uh, across Europe. And but it, it bears it, you know, bears mention here, Katie, that genocide was practiced by many states, particularly colonial powers, before it's proscribed in 1948. 
It is actually the practice of, you know, the establishment of U.S. settler sovereignty um, uh, in North America, as well as Canada, as well as uh, Australia. Genocide is uh, known as a practice before it happens within Europe's shores, at which point it becomes proscribed in this treaty. It's when Aime Cesare, right, Martinican, writer, cultural critic of, of, of the negritude movement, you know, admonishes Europe for their, you know, their, their unilateral condemnation of Adolf Hitler, but reminds them that Hitler is literally a manifestation of colonial violence that's been meted across all colonial geographies. That what Hitler was in Europe is precisely what the United States and Britain and France and Germany and Italy have been across uh, colonial geographies and yet is not recognized nor is legible until it happens within Europe's shores. I don't say that to run my mouth. I say it to highlight the the contradiction, right, and an and, and inherent white supremacy within international law that is actually meant to enshrine, you know, European powers and European, right, uh, supremacy, their ability to plunder, um, you know, it, international law begins, right, as, as a seed in order to facilitate the expansion of empire. You know, Anthony Ng, he teaches us that sovereignty as a concept isn't established before a uh, colonial invasion, but is established at the moment of the colonial encounter with indigenous peoples. How is it that you define uh, this encounter and define for the, it, at the, in this moment, the Spanish right to conquest, right. will you do it by denying that indigenous peoples have a right to title, right? And that indigenous people have a right to, to, to you, to war, to wage war. And this is, um, this is in the work just to get a little bit more nerdy about it, yeah. but this is the Spanish theologian, Francis de Vitoria, who, you know, intervenes and disrupts papal authority at the time that says you cannot forcibly convert non-Christians to Christianity in order to bring them to salvation. But at the same time that he's displacing divine law and replacing it with natural law is also creating in natural law, a universal framework that establishes the Spanish as the universal human. So that now native Americans can be spared death in order to be forcibly converted to Christianity. But are not afforded, you know, the a mantle of humanity until they become like the Spanish right. um, and replica of them. International law has continued to produce these dynamics. Internet, whether it be human rights law, the laws of war, right? This is the third world approaches to international law tradition, which I'm a part of, that examines the underside of international law in producing these outcomes. And actually, you know, in the words of a, of, of a, you know, a Nazi jurist, Carl Schmidt, who's still cited across laws of war, who said, there's no such thing as international law. There's a, there is law for European society and a law for non-European society. How else can you explain this moment where we are witnessing the most well-documented case of genocide and it's unfolding before our eyes because of, you know, social media. And yet right. still you have the, you know, world superpower explaining that those very people who are being annihilated are actually the aggressors. There's an illegibility. There's an illegibility in these Western traditions and in this particular framework of law to recognize Palestinians in this moment as civilians, which is also, Katie, sorry, this is also part of a legal tradition where indigenous peoples are not recognized as civilians in the establishment of the first laws of war and the Libra Code in the course of, you know, the American Civil War, and where brown and black peoples are not recognized as civilians, right? That doesn't happen really until, you know, it happens in two iterations in 1949, um, with the, you know, with the establishment of, of the fourth Geneva convention and a framework of law that applies to occupied peoples, but even more so it happens when, when, um, in 1977, when nascent sovereigns are recognized as having the right to fight and use force. So what we're seeing right now, right, which I, I know for most people, 
it just feels, you know, I was on the phone with a, with a colleague and it, and you know, for him, he feels, you know, gaslit. It's, it doesn't, it's, it's non-comprehendable what's happening. Well, what's happening is this is colonialism. We are not merely experiencing a colonial legacy. We are literally experiencing yeah. colonial power. So back to the definition, I had to say all that and define yeah, yeah, genocide course, yeah. because, you know, at the end of the day, I can tell you what the definition is. Sure. And I can tell you that the two primary elements of the genocide convention are the specific intent, which are the most difficult to prove because oftentimes you know, uh, world power or, or, or military belligerents will, will kill and then say, but we didn't have the intent to kill them. It was warfare, right? This is right. Mahmoud Mamdani's critique of, of thinking about the Iraq war versus what we named genocide in Rwanda and the politics of naming. Well, you killed just as many Iraqis, but you mm. never described that as genocide. It's because the U.S. says that that was warfare. Okay, but what's yeah. difficult and the difference here is the specific intent this isn't merely about waging um, a war that had a tremendous amount of collateral damage. This is specifically about getting rid of Palestinians, they, removing them and describing that as a security imperative. Yeah. So they've made genocide the military objective and then said that it's warfare, but that that's where it gets tricky because they've obviously made that specific intent. The second, the second part of it is um, uh, specific underlying acts. And here, this is also very well documented from their own, from themselves. They've cut out fuel and electricity and water. They've bombed humanitarian corridors. They've bombed and gutted hospitals, 26 out of 35 hospitals. They've said that Palestinians have to flee from or re be removed from the north of Gaza to the south. Um in, a, in an explicit bid for ethnic cleansing, right? They've already removed two thirds of the population, 400,000, about 800,000 remain. Those 800,000 are gonna be left without any access to medical care because all of the hospitals have been systematically attacked. They've said that, I, and I'm sorry, I don't have the name right now, but that part of the military objective is disease. Mm -hmm. And they've created disease and a lot of diarrheal conditions, cholera, um, and other condi preventable conditions, they too have described that as a, a, a weapon of warfare against Hamas. None of this, Katie, none of it would be possible were it not for a deeply, deeply embedded anti-Palestinian racism. Right. None of it would be possible also without Islamophobia because you couldn't in your right mind hear this and watch this uh, meet it against any people if you actually believed that they deserved to live, right? And that they were human and then say, yeah, but war is ugly, right? right? It's precisely because of a, 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 a crude, cruel racism, right? That has created this uh, expectations, expectation that Palestinians will die and worse, that they must die quietly. Otherwise, they're the aggressor, right? And so this is why for us for so many years who have been, you know, demonstrating that this is a racial issue, like one of the issues that I took, stop me when you want, but one of no, the no, issues that is I great. took, have taken, you know, the book project that I was working on that now is about, you know, to shift a bit, it's a co-authored project with Professor John Reynolds of Maynooth University in, in, in Dublin. And we've been, you know, fleshing out a text on dismantling the apartheid of our time, which means this, you know, actually confronting Zionism, right? One of the things, all of the human rights reports that came out in 2020 and 2021 actually did made very deliberate aversion to tackling Zionism or even to describing the condition as a racist condition, that Israel was a racist state. Instead, they demonstrated, right, the, the uh, crime of persecution and demonstrated the intent to dominate in order to maintain Jewish supremacy, but refuse deliberately to frame or discuss it as racist, mm. right? It's it's a tinderbox. It's a tinderbox because the other edge of that is, right, Jews mm. have been framed as a race. They Their racialization is precisely oh, right. what leads is precisely what leads, right, to, to Nazi genocide. So the, it's a tinderbox. People don't want to touch it. But we have to. It's precisely because Zionism is racism. 
and produces racial discrimination as an ideology. It's not a movement for, you know, emancipation. It is a racist ideology that has racialized um, Jews or, you know, as, as they've also juridically created um, Jew right. as a juridical category, right? It's not, in Israel. It's not the same thing in Israel, right? right? But also by extension in Israel, but in a way that becomes extraterritorial, right? Um, right. the law, the, the, the citizenship right. law and, 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 um, the law of return basically right. frames, you know, it's that you become, um, a Jewish national in Israel, even if you've never been there, it becomes right. an extraterritorial yeah. right that you can claim upon entry. But that racialization also has a counterpart which is the racialization of Palestinians. Palestinians is dangerous, as presumptively anti-Semitic. Palestinians as primordial. Palestinians as barbaric, right? Palestinians not valuing not life. not loving their children. Right. Palestinians of not valuing life, right? All of these tropes that are now so casually, so too casually, right? Iterated and, and said over and over again, are racist. Yeah are racist and 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 it's incumbent upon us to understand that there is no genocide without racism and the crisis here is a crisis of accountability and colonialism obviously but apartheid is a racial colonial project it was never just a racist project we can talk about that too in the way yeah. that you know um it's been neutered and made to become far more liberal as a domesticated racial project. In fact, it's an international one that's characterized by colonialism. Um, but the re that's the crisis. It's a crisis of accountability. C Kirby saying, we have to stop this so that there's never another October 7th. Yeah, you right. can stop this. It's called dismantling apartheid. Right. Right? It's yeah, called I mean, taking on Zionism. When, when you mentioned that, you made me uh, about the racism that's embedded in people's acceptance of what's uh, happening. It did remind me of, you know, everyone pointed out the difference between the response to Ukraine and, and Palestine and how they're freedom fighters in Ukraine. And you had like articles in the New York times about how they made Molotov cocktails. And, you know, I don't think people would be okay with this, quote unquote, collateral damage if they were blonde haired, blue eyed kids. I don't think people would be OK with um, that. And not that, that that you're OK with it or that I'm OK with it or that people watching are OK with it. Um, it's I mean, it's it's like. It's infuriating and heartbreaking every day to watch the news. The one thing I want to push back, Katie, is like just thinking about race. I, I, I one, I totally agree with you about just the. It's just so obvious, right? Yeah. It's just so obvious and blatant, and so offensive to our intelligence for for President Biden to want to make the parallel between Ukraine and Israel. It's so offensive. Oh my god! It's, it's, not, it's so right. it's so ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, I don't. I don't understand Especially how because Russia is actually a nuclear power. Israel is a nuclear right. power. I mean, beyond, you know, just, just the empirics of it before you get right. into the normative nature, right. Of sure. what yeah. you describe as justice and freedom. Okay. But the one thing that I, I, you know, I go like this only to say that, um, Bosnians, um, are many of them are fair skinned and light yeah. eyes, light eyed. Many Palestinians are fair skinned right. and light eyed. Right. That racialization isn't merely here, you know, just standing at the edge of who looks like us and who doesn't right. look like us, right? There's there's a lot that goes into constructing the racial other. Other, yeah. Um, and here, a big part of it for the United States is also what serves its national interests. Right. And so, you know, the the fact that it is that it is engaged in, you know, uh, a, a, a proxy war against Russia very much, uh, you know, of shapes course. who is our enemy and who is our friend. And that is very much also right. What's happening yeah. here. Like this worthy is, victims, like Chomsky's idea of worthy victims, right? The mm -hmm. worthy victims are the ones who are being killed by our adversaries as opposed always, to being killed always. by our allies. Yeah. I, you know, I, I teach laws of war to my students and it's really difficult because, you know, you want to think about, you want to think about basically this is the legit legitimacy of violence. Who has the right to use violence and when? Yeah. 
right? These are concepts of just war. These are concepts of like, we, we only, only defensive force is, is acceptable, whether it's in customary law or the charter definition of it and so on and so forth. But I like to begin with my students to have them think of, of cinema that they watch. And when, you know, in watching that cinema where there's a lot of violence, when they're actually rooting for, for those who are using violence and when, right? So what's constructed is exactly that. Who is a worthy victim? Who, who do we want to give the green light to? And it's who we shape as a protagonist. In this situation, the racialization of Palestinians is so endemic, yeah, right? That Israel can literally, Israeli leaders, can literally, you know, be be talk, you know, advocating for genocide, citing scripture, right? Which should, at some level, shouldn't that at some level really bother liberals? Yeah, right. Who, the who, theocratic who nature of it, liberalism. Yeah, yeah. Right? right. And yet, are giving Israel a green light. They want to yeah. turn away. They want Israel to get the job done and turn away right. and look back and then lament about it later, but say it was necessary. And th this is another crisis that we're in, right? The, 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 the fact that many people aren't speaking, some aren't speaking because they're afraid, which I understand, but it's still problematic. Yeah. But many people aren't speaking because for them, it's far easier to continue this colonial reality of removing indigenous people and indigenous sovereignties in order to you know, and manifest uh, colonial hegemony than it is to actually confront colonialism. And here, yeah. in this case, settler colonialism, right? Not once, not once have we actually had a discussion about Zionism. Yeah. Discussions that were actually central in in the uh, during Third World Revolt that culminated in the 1975, you know, General Assembly resolution that recognized Zionism as a form of racism alongside apartheid and other forms of colonialism as you know the third world was leg legislating a decade against racism right why can we not have that discussion why is it more palatable for people right to 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 a green light genocide and the removal of palestinians than it is for people to think about challenging the idea of uh, 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 an exclusive Jewish state based on racial supremacy. Yeah. How is that possible? And I think part of it is it's an anemic discussion. People don't know how to talk about it. And anything that concerns, um, you know, J Jewish life becomes subsumed within, an, uh, you know, uh, somehow an accusation of anti-Semitism. Right. And there's a weaponization that's impeded these conversations, that's made it yeah. easier for people to accept genocide than it is to challenge Zionism in Israel. Yeah. It's like we care. One, I mean, there's obviously geostrategic reasons behind everything, right? So it's not, one of the things that took me a while to realize is that Israel wasn't founded, the colonial powers that supported Israel's foundation we're not doing that because they cared about Jews. And I think once you right. get that, a lot of other stuff clicks into place. But it, this idea, then it becomes so seductive from an, like narratively to pretend that that's why this country exists, why this nation was founded. And then you don't, like you're saying, people will tiptoe around it because of the trauma and tragedy of the Holocaust. But what you're basically doing is saying because of one group's trauma and tragedy, we have no choice but to let that group, not that group, because now I'm doing that. I'm like conflating Jews and Zionists. But because of that trauma and tragedy, another group is going to have to be subjected to trauma and tragedy. A group that had nothing to do with the trauma and tragedy inflicted on Jews during the Holocaust. But that's that's exactly the problem, right? We we have to be able to recognize the trauma that's associated with the Holocaust, right? Or any genocide and recognize yeah. the trauma associated with that, how it lives in people's bodies, how that legacy isn't disappeared, right? At the same time, to be able to be critical of how even that trauma then becomes weaponized. Yeah, how of course. All people Many peoples have survived the apocalypse, right. uh, their own apocalypse, right? Native Americans, okay, Lakota, um, 
um, nation, thinking about the Sioux Nation, thinking about Piscataway, thinking about the Pinkasha. All these nations have survived the apocalypse yeah. and live with trauma. Do we forgive them of anything? Tomorrow, Palestinians who survive this trauma, are we going to, obviously not, you can't even imagine it, but do you forgive right. them of anything? Um, no, yeah. Descendants, um, African descendants in the United States, right? Descendants of, of slaves in the U.S. and are, are literally survived apocalypse. Yeah. In in the transatlantic slave trade, in their enslavement, and the ripping apart of families, and the kidnapping of children systematically, and transforming them into property. Does that trauma then justify, you know, any kind of reaction? Obviously not. We would right. answer unequivocally no in right. every situation. And yet here, because of the political project, right? This is Behind not it. merely... Yeah. There's a political project. So let's examine this. Let's examine this, right? You said something really important. Israel was not founded in response to the Holocaust. That is absolute mythology and completely lazy, right? The concept of an Israeli state, or before it was Israel, the concept of a, of a Jewish state is born in the crucible of, of systematic anti-Semitism or anti-Jewish bigotry in Europe, right? And particularly in Eastern Europe where, there, where, where segregation, ghettoization, and exclusion is more endemic. We see um, in, in a number of Western states where there's, you know, citizenship is extended to, to Jews who are recognized as citizens, right? It's in this milieu, right, of, of white supremacy and the systematic exclusion of Jews, right. that there is a question about can Jews fully, right? How do you resolve the, the Jewish question? Will they escape this kind of persecution? Right. So here's where we get to see this idea. Now, what Theodor Herzl proposes when he publishes the Jewish state, which, you know, emerges 15 years after Nathan Birnbaum had coined the term. But when he proposes this idea in the Jewish state in the late 19th century, he proposes a particular form of, of Zionism, which is a Western tradition. It's the idea that there will be a Jewish state where you happen to, you happen to be Jewish, but you're basically a European citizen. There's nothing different about it in contradiction to other, you know, Eastern traditions of Zionism that imagine that the Jewish state would be a place to revive and rehabilitate the, the religion itself. I mean, the, obviously there's a, and this is the tip of the iceberg, right? Yeah. And this is the tip of, of, of the complicated, you know, history and nature of, of these debates, but it's enough. It's enough to indicate for us that this is well preceding the Holocaust. It's well yeah. preceding the Holocaust. And it's an idea that emerges in response to the Jewish question. When Britain proposes the Balfour Declaration in 1917. And the foreign minister obviously proposed that it's adopted by British, British Parliament that designates Palestine as a site of Jewish settlement, and I should say Jewish Zionist settlement. In that moment, Britain had its own concepts, you know, had its own ideas as well. And one of them was to be able to permanently penetrate the Middle East and right. to do it based on, a, you know, a long-tested a uh, colonial, you know, tactic, which is to have a minority to protect, whether it be a Christian minority protected by the French, right, in, in Lebanon, or it be a, a, a Jewish minority. Now, Jews existed, ac exist across the Middle right. East. I want to say continue to exist, and I want to manifest that. They are part of the Middle East and have historically and continue to be part of the Middle East before they're concentrated and have their identity usurped um, by, by Zionism as Israelis, where now they have to forcibly bifurcate their Arab and their Jewish identity, right. right? Anyway, all of this to say is that even then when Britain is proposing this, it's not to, it's not to respond. It, it's not, you know, out of goodness and care, uh, for Jews either. Right. And, and we see that we see that when Britain finally reverses its Zionist policy in 1939, when it issues the white paper in response to the great revolt that's led by the Palestinians between 36 and 39, where they say, yeah, Zionism is not going to work. The only way that it's going to work, you know, by taking away a native population's land is through the constant use of force. Right. Literally, they, they, they recognize 
that this is untenable. And then World War II um, begins before, you know, that reversal can take shape. And by the end of World War II, now there's, you know, you know, Nazi genocide um, is, is manifest, um, becomes well known. And the Palestine itself is no longer about, right, Palestinians and Zionists or the Balfour Declaration, but it really, even in the UN Special Committee on Palestine in 1947, becomes a forum of what do we do with the Jewish refugees? Right. Well, why are they refugees? they won't take them why in. are they refugees they have been stripped of their citizenship where they had it and many of them did not have it they've been stripped of their citizenship where they have it and these other countries do not want to absorb them it is an anti-semitic response right. as well right so i understand how all of that com you know complexity becomes a race in this particular moment but it's so important for us, one, to raise it because it also, it raises the point, Katie, that you brought up. There's, we should not be conflating Jewish people and Zionism, right? right? Which is a political, nationalist political project that is chauvinist in nature, that is supremacist in nature, that is built on the idea of exclusivity and, 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 you know, uh, exclusivity um, and and the constant taking of, of Palestinian land in order to establish uh, a new Israeli nation right. and not just Jews, right? This is the transformation of, of, of Jews into um, a, Zion, a, a Jewish national, right? And that's consecrated right. in the idea that that happens in labor that's done upon the land itself. Right. All right. Now, fast forward to this moment. Not only is all of this historical, you know, elision evident and, and complicating the story, but we have more complication deliberately now when analysts are repeating the mantra that this attack on, on Israel, the October 7th attack, is the most significant attack on Jews since the Holocaust. Yeah. How irresponsible. How irresponsible for to draw a through line between Nazi genocide, which racialized a Jewish people and targeted them systematically in order to achieve Aryan racial purity and, and German, you know, um, glory once again, right? Make Germany great again right. after um, their uh, defeat in, in the First right. World War. To, to the attack which targeted Israelis, right? Which targeted Israeli nationals. It did not target um, Jews uh, across the world. It did not target right. them based on a supremacist logic. And, and in fact, what we're seeing now, we haven't even been able to have this conversation because it's been so sensationalized, right? That we can't even have a conversation. What happened... Um, on October 7th, and what, what's being revealed, number one, a tremendous amount, right? A tremendous amount, including the fact that there were 1,200, not 1,400 people killed, that nearly 350 of them are combatants or soldiers who should be distinguished from civilians, right. that Apache, Israeli Apache helicopters actually targeted um, the the Israelis and, and Kibbutz Ma'ari um, not Hamas, that 200, that the, the, the images of those who are being burned are the actually burnt bodies, right? burnt bodies of Hamas militants, that, the, that Hamas didn't know about the rave. They weren't targeting the rave. They didn't know about the rave. And that that was crossfire and a lot of Israeli gunfire that killed the ravers. I'm not saying any of this to excuse or absolve you know, what happened, I say this because the fact that we're on day 46 and can't talk about this openly ha has to do with an with an, a hysteria that wants to give Israel the green light to basically use unrestricted violence and, and cruelty against Palestinians in order to annihilate them. And that's why this conversation is so important. And yet we haven't been able to have it. We can't even talk about who Hamas is. Right. Right. We can't even, they have a history. They 
they exist. They don't come into you know existence until 1987. That's what um, 30 years after the establishment, nearly 30, three decades after the establishment of Israel, they are formed in response to ongoing occupation. Israel first tries to occupy the Gaza Strip in 56 before it occupies it in 67, right? Before the, you know, and, and we can talk, I don't know, talk about self-defense and so on and so forth. Right. Um, um, and then the, the, the tactic and, and they form also an opposition to, to, to Fatah and to the PLO, um, which is about to enter also into the peace process, which we, where we see them relinquish both rescind, um, the, the, you know, the, the resolution that Zionism is a form of racism. We yeah. see also the rescindment of the right to use force, which is not, I mean, they're basically capitulating everything that they should have kept as even as part of their negotiating leverage. And all, all the PLO got was recognition by the settler sovereign. And I'm again, I'm not saying this to absolve Hamas in any way, but this history matters. Otherwise, right. they float around like a boogeyman that are basically looking, um, you know, for for to 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 hurt and abuse Jews anywhere in the world. Right. Right. And it becomes it's about like, hatred of Jews as opposed to is uh, the the state of Israel. And even and even this constant reference to their charter, the fact that they're. Right. They amend their charter in 2017. No they that. make that yeah. very explicit. I'm also, I have to keep repeating, I'm not defending, but this matters right. because we have to understand them as actually a political actor. They're not Right, and just... this compare, conflation of them with ISIS, which is so inaccurate, but also matters because how the... The characterization of an organization will di will dictate what you should be expecting to happen. In other words, the idea that you can't negotiate with Hamas because they're like ISIS, they're saying that, right? Because they don't actually care about the captives. Like Israel and the United States don't care about the captives. They're making it seem like I like Hamas is like ISIS, that you can't negotiate mm. with them mm. um, because they don't actually want that to happen. They want to allow for the ethnic cleansing that's happening. I mean, if you want to, yeah. And then if you want to get into the host, I mean, let me just, to finish the thought yeah, about, sorry, yeah. no, 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 it's fine. But like Hamas is a political actor. I mean, the fact that Hamas actually takes, is influenced by the Muslim Brotherhood. They were a resistance movement and then be, run for elections because of their influence by the Muslim Brotherhood um, in Egypt. And actually that's the kernel of, of their establishment and then enter into formal politics when they win parliamentary elections in 2006. They're never given the mandate to govern and then to fail. Yeah. I think they would have failed. Palestinians would have mm -hmm. voted them out. But when they won, they won as a referendum against the peace process, which was very obviously a sovereignty trap that was used as a liberal veneer to allow Israel to take more Palestinian lands under a framework of peacemaking and against Fatah, which becomes an, or, or, the, or the Fatah dominated Palestinian authority, which becomes part and parcel of, of the occupation regime. Right. This, these are political decisions that they make when they leave Syria in the midst of the Syrian uprising, and then they relocate to Doha, Qatar, they're making a political decision that they will not survive in the midst of, you, they couldn't side with the Assad regime and they couldn't side uh, with the uprising. It was a lose-lose situation for them. So they relocate. This is a political decision. I mean, and, and then, you know, then talk about the fact that it, Hamas has actually been one of Israel's partners, one of Israel's partners in maintaining more quiet than we, you know, think about there hasn't been rockets. There hasn't been um, anything from Gaza except for intermittently, right? Because Hamas actually um, rooted out ISIS when it established itself in the yeah. Gaza Strip and you know has authority over its adversaries that might want to use more force and Hamas and Israel have established an equilibrium and they have engaged in negotiations multiple times that were mediated by Egypt and Qatar now it's also mediated by Egypt and Qatar which gets us to the point where immediately they were negotiating for the release of 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 their hostages right Palestinian prisoners right 
And the same deal that we see now on the table is the deal that has been on the table um, since before the ground invasion began, as well as since um, before the invasion of Al Shifa Hospital. Why is it that we haven't seen Israel take up, you know, opportunities to release the hostages? Well, twofold. Number one, as you pointed out, that the, they'd rather kill Israel yeah. as, as part of, of what's known as the Hannibal Doctrine yeah. and the response to the, the experience of the, you know, captured soldier Gilad Shalit, right? Kill your hostages before you have to negotiate again, Right. And so we saw we've seen this on full display. That's why we see a tremendous amount of 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 conflict by the families of Israeli uh, of of the hostage you know civilian hostages by the Israelis who are who are opposed right to the government. Re they can release all the hostages. Hamas right. and they has made it clear they will negotiate their whole release. They released four without any with, pre with any without anything in return. Yeah, for humanitarian Absolutely reasons. Not. Right. And have said multiple times, we'll release 50 women um, and and the children. We want just stop the bombardment for right. five days because Hamas doesn't even know where all the hostages are because they've actually been taken by by other factions. So they actually have to they need time to, to locate them. They've told us this over and over. Right. So they haven't negotiated because one is not to negotiate at all. Two, because this is extending the shelf life of Netanyahu's political career, yeah. which is absolutely over once this is over. Netanyahu is blamed for the October 7th attacks. The fact that there was no security at the time, there was, a you know, the fact that he had actually emboldened Hamas and his bid to undermine um, the possibility of the establishment of a Palestinian state for Netanyahu extending the you know the, the this genocide is an extension of his political life right that's right. two and the third is that this is providing what you know the leaked document from the minister uh you know that it was a, it was a think tank yeah Miska, forget the name but it was also had relationships to the minister uh, ministry of interior that basically said this is quote a rare and unique opportunity right that won't complete. come again yeah to complete the Sinai plan or the evacuation of Palestinians in Gaza to the Sinai. Right. right? You know, Katie, I, I, I'm listening to myself talking to you and all of this almost sounds, you know, conspiratorial, right. not for any other reason, except for the fact that we have literally had no space to actually have a discussion about these things. We have not been able to examine Israel critically. We have not been able to examine Zionism. We've not been able to examine the crisis of, 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 of a lack of accountability that has led us to this moment. What did people think was going to happen? I understand that people are shocked, but how are people surprised yeah. that a refugee population that has been under uh, 70 exiled for 75 years under occupation for 56 years and subject to a debilitating siege for 17 years where children who were born in 2006, what they're now, um, my math is so awful, 13, uh, years old, 17 years old, that those children who are 17 years old have lived through five major aerial and ground offensives, not all of them ground, but all aerial offensives and a debilitating siege. What did they think these young people were going to do as the rest of the world in this moment was negotiating the Abraham Accords yeah. to actually normalize Israel's relationship with Arab regimes even further? And is even after, you, and everyone is applauding apartheid and normalizing it. What did they think was going to be the outcome of this? What do you think is the outcome of chronic racial colonialism? It breeds this kind of violence. It is violence. It is violence. And so the fact that we're not having that discussion, right, about you've had an entire international human rights community, right, You've had UN Esqua come to the conclusion that this is apartheid. You've had right. Human Rights Watch. You've had Yesh Dean. You've had Beth Selim. You've had Amnesty International. You've had the Human Rights Clinic at Harvard Law School all come to this conclusion. You've had 
these, um, you know, civilian tribunals like the Russell Tribunal um, that was held in South Africa come to this conclusion. You've had Al-Haq, you know, and all these Palestinian Palestinian organizations and Palestinian thinkers who have been forwarding this analysis for decades, we're suddenly going to make that all disappear and act like you're going to act like, um, you know, racist colonialism is, is just supposed to exist freely and with right. acceptance in the world. I mean, I'm really, I'm obviously very frustrated because I've been doing this work for a long time. You read my bio. I do a tremendous amount of scholarship on this work. And I have your book too. <laughs> right there. Awesome. Your book. Yeah. Thanks. And and yet here in this moment, there's a complete amnesia as if they're, you know, they're talking to a Palestinian for the first time in their life. They've never seen a Palestinian. They don't know what we're talking about. And Hamas came out of nowhere. Right. Right. There and it's it's, you know, I'm I'm really, really thirsty for an honest conversation. I'm really, really eager for a, 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 a difficult conversation, one that actually gets us, there's, you know, there's fracture in the Palestinian community, right. there's complexity there. We're not getting there even because yeah. we're still at the surface level of trying to convince governments that genocide is not a legitimate form of warfare. You do not negotiate to end genocide. It is unequivocal. It doesn't come with conditions, right? It's just not, it's not legitimate, period. This isn't like a legitimate war against Hamas, if that's what Israel wants to do, in which case we can discuss, you know, conditions and disarmament and da 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 right. da This is genocide, right? right? And we're still here. We can't even have that conversation. Yeah, it's, 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 a really, it's a really frustrating moment. Yeah, and I saw that you, by the way, lest anyone think you're being a conspiracy theorist, Brad, I think, has a, a newspaper headline to throw up. Netanyahu, money to Hamas, part of strategy to keep Palestinians divided. Um, that's from 2019. And then, of course, uh, we'll link to it in the in the show notes because there is that that article that you talked about um, that the, the blueprint from that think tank where they lay everything out. So we'll put. I'm that very in happy also. to provide all the citations, oh, yeah, 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 or course, yeah. as some would call yeah. the receipts. I mean, obviously, I'm not. You know. The, you know, Tarek Ba'oni's book on Hamas Contained is really wonderful. Khaled Hroub's book on Hamas is, yeah. is, is something that we should read. You know, if we're, if we're listing, um, I worked on a project in 2000, in the aftermath of the 2014 um, onslaught of Gaza, where we produced with a team um, at the at, at Jadalia and Arab Studies Institute, a bibliography of 110 entries specifically thinking about, you know, um, Gaza in, in particular, this scholarship is ample on, yeah. on these issues and, and everything that we're talking about in terms of Netanyahu's interests, the Hannibal directive, um, even thinking about, you know, the, if you, I mean, we didn't talk as much about laws of war, which have been really interesting. Um, but in 2006, Israel establishes the Dahi doctrine in right. its campaign against Lebanon, where it basically, that you know, we begin, we begin to see the very the formalization, right, of of the transformation of civilians into legitimate targets, right. in as far as Israel's laws of war are concerned. And right? you're saying that's the one that says you can. The goal is to respond with disproportionate force, right? That's the explicitly, explicitly. Yeah. They they say everything out loud, yeah. and then we Justify get to mainstream Western media, which then starts to spin it, or to the White House, which then starts to spin right. it. But Israelis are speaking incredibly honestly, yeah. and have right. been, and have been. And then Biden talks about the forty babies. Then he walks it back, and then he says it again. And then he says it again, and then he says it again. I mean. You know, I, I, you know, but it, it, it's just an absolute, I mean, first of all, I think he's personally invested. Yeah. I mean, he, at he this loves point, to say he's, he's a Zionist. At this, he's contradicting his, his base. 80% of yeah. Democrats want a ceasefire. Um, a letter across 40 U.S. agencies of 500 signatories have opposed this. Congressional walkout of a thousand staffers have opposed this. There's three now, three State Department memos that have been leaked in opposition um, to Biden's policy, he's even contravening, you know, um, his own ranks 
And yeah. I think that it reflects a personal commitment um, in in this moment that you know I I that isn't even you know even not even self interested if you think right. about um, you know the uh, election upcoming elections and and right. his, his the possibilities of his prevalence. I mean, this actually hurts the entire Democratic Party. Right. Period. The yeah. entire Democratic Party that couldn't respond uh, to its base. When have 80% of Democrats agreed on anything? On anything, right. I just wanted to ask you, you've been so generous with your time. I just have two more questions uh, for you, if you don't mind. One is um, just to let people know about the lawsuit that you're involved in um, mm. related to genocide. And then I wanted to have you uh, talk about the Auschwitz Museum statement because I saw you tweet about that. So up to you which one you want to address first. I mean, the Auschwitz statement, I'll start there because it's okay. in line. Let it's me bring up the, let me bring that up so that I can, um, I think it'll be helpful, right? If I, if I read it. Okay. Resolution of the International Auschwitz Council on the tragic events in Israel approved by circulation on 18 November, 2023. The International Auschwitz Council by the Prime Minister of the Republic of Poland acknowledges with the deepest pain and sorrow the suffering of innocent victims, tortured, raped, taken hostage, and murdered by Hamas terrorists. We wish to express our unwavering solidarity with Israelis and Jews worldwide. Threatened in its existence, the state of Israel has the right to self-defense in accordance with international law and the principles of humanitarianism. The existence of a free, sovereign, and democratic Jewish state is one of the pillars of world peace. The unimaginable hatred and violence perpetrated by terrorists only results in extensive and more widespread suffering, affecting also the civilian population of Gaza, whom Hamas exploits as human shields. An essential first step to halt the horrifying spiral of death and war is the immediate and unconditional release of all hostages, a demand we make with all our might. And you wrote that, um, you had a great line about it. I think you said it was um, epic moral failure, an epic moral failure. I mean, it's horrible. It's absolutely horrible. I mean, aside from the fact of how, where do we start to pick apart the narrative that's established in this statement, right? The idea of a democratic state, which democratic state there is no democratic state. This is an apartheid regime. Number one, perhaps if there was democracy, this would have never happened, right? Number one. Number two, the idea that Palestinians are all being used as human shields. Right. That's the securitization. I mean, I mean, if one, um, th again, this is incredibly racist to imagine that, um, all Palestinians suddenly become legitimate targets because the adversary used them as human shields. And people should also understand that this is precisely the same rhetoric and warfare uh, in, that, that, that was used in asymmetric warfare no. during the height of third world revolt. We're all nascent sovereigns and liberation armies were framed as hiding amongst the ranks, right? The Viet Cong or think about the ANC or think about, um, um, Namibia um, and other, you know, other revolutionary armies that were were accused of the same same thing, right? This rhetoric of turning them into human shields. But let's fast forward. If you just want to talk about the law, right? Article fifty seven of the first additional protocol makes it incumbent on state belligerents to refrain from an operation where the 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 civilian cost and the civilian harm is too high. It doesn't matter. Imagining that Hamas is the most right. evil force on earth. Okay. And doing exactly what you're, you're saying it's doing that doesn't absolve the state belligerent from its responsibility and duty to abide by laws of war. Right. right. It doesn't. And that same logic of, 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 of who's a legitimate target you can make that same you can make that same argument about Israelis who are reservists. Yeah, exactly. Or who who are actually in the army but might not be fighting at the time and not might be armed at the time. We would not do that. Right. No one would We would immediately that, yeah. recognize how dangerous that is, right? How annihilistic that is. But it's because of the racism against Palestinians that it becomes logical that somehow that becomes okay. And if we are talking about law, 
We also need to understand that Israel does not have a right of self-defense against territory that it occupies. Yeah. That was stated in 2004 by the ICJ, the International Court of Justice Advisory Opinion in 2004, paragraph 139. Israel cannot use force against, you know, uh, to, to defend a territory from which the threat has come. It has the ultimate policing and military power in that territory. Then later in 2000, uh, many Israelis, that was 2004, and then after unilateral disengagement in 2005, Many apologists said, you know, and tried to argue that it, Gaza was no longer occupied. Well, yes, it is. Yeah. And the ICC, the ICC itself concluded as much after its review in 2010 of the case by Comoros um, and and two other um, sovereigns who at, whose boats were commandeered in, in the flotilla that was meant to right. break the Gaza siege. There, the ICJ said very explicitly Israel remains in effective control of the territory. Actually, I was looking at this today. Um, I can just, since you're reading, maybe I can read uh, sure, yeah, for please. you. Yeah. Paragraph 27 um, of this decision uh, says, in 2014, says, the view is, ba in general, the view that they're still occupied is based on the scope and degree of control that Israel has retained over the territory of Gaza following the 2005 engagement, including... Israel's exercise of control over border crossings, the territorial sea adjacent to the Gaza Strip, the airspace of Gaza, its periodic military incursions within Gaza, its enforcement of no-go areas within Gaza near the border where the Israeli settlements used to be, its regulation of the local monetary market based on the Israeli currency and control of taxes and customs duties, the retention of such competences by Israel over the territory of Gaza, even after the 2005 dis disengagement overall supports the conclusion that the authority retained by Israel amounts to effective control. Israel remains an occupying power. You cannot use military force and self-defense against the territory that where you occupy. This came up in, I want to say, 1973. Um, early 1970s, uh, when it was reviewed whether or not Portugal had the right to use um, force and self-defense to defend you know, it's holding its colonial holdings in Mozambique and Angola, as well right. as, you know, um, South Africa's hold or Afrikaners hold on South Africa. Right. It was rejected then. It was rejected that you cannot use self-defense is not available to colonial and occupying powers to defend the territories that they hold. Why? Yeah. Because that hold is illegitimate to begin with. And yet, rather than discuss how do we break apart that hold, the discussion we're having is how do we give Israel more military power and more force in order to um, in order to consecrate its hold, right? Yeah. Um, I don't. I mean, thank you for for creating this space to have these discussions. But I'm. This is. Uh, we can't even get here. Right. We can't even get here. I can have these discussions and academic conferences. Obviously, it's in the book. It's, you know, it's yeah. available. If you read juris, international legal jurisprudence, you right. can say it. But literally, instead, we're spending so much time not only responding to spin, but much, much more heartbreakingly, Katie, basically trying to tell people that genocide is not OK in any situation. And yeah. in this situation, Israel is saying that it's doing it. It's saying that it's necessary to do it in order to ensure its, you know, its defense and, you know, its longevity, right? As, as, uh, uh, you know, um, an apartheid state, right? Um, and also wanting, basically, establishing a precedent. And what happens in international laws that precedents matter. Right. If Israel can commit a genocide in the name of its establishing its security, who else can commit a genocide right. to do so? So when really, when people, you know, when folks said never again and established genocide as a yus kosian's norm, right, which means you can never abrogate it. You can't make, you can't create a new treaty that makes it legal. You can't enter, enter into, uh, you know, even agreement between two parties to make it legal. Torture, slavery, and genocide are yus kosian's norm, are never permissible. Mm. And yet here we have in response, hey, John Kirby, right? 
790 scholars have signed a statement October 19th that um, in it was October 15th or October 19th. I'm going to get these messed up. But mid-October that said that uh, this was genocide. A UN panel of experts also in mid-October agreed that this was genocide. Our petition to the ICC is one of three petitions, um, I think now to the ICC, that has also charged Israel with genocide. Five states have now referred to the case to the office of, of the uh, uh, prosecutor that this is genocide, right? So it's not clear to me what makes it not genocide? Nobody right. has explained that to us. The only explanation that we're given that it's not genocide is that Israel should be allowed to do it, right? Yeah. What other explanation have we gotten? That it's not genocide. Either that Palestinians are not real civilians and they're all animals and they deserve to die, right? Or that this is okay because Israel should be allowed to use whatever force it needs to in order to ensure its national security. But that's precisely why we have international law. If all states were allowed to do that, we there, you know, there would this, be no regulation of the use of force. There would be no this, point. The scariest response I've seen, and I think I saw you respond to this in a tweet, is no, it's not genocide because if Israel wanted to wipe them out, they could in about two seconds. Yeah, this I'm <laughs> that was Piers Morgan. Um, but okay, Piers, yeah. he's, he said that in a show with Owen Jones. Um, and, and Piers Morgan is not alone. I, I see that all right, the time. I've seen that who said again and me. again. Yeah. We're like, if it was really genocide, there would be more Palestinians killed. No, yeah. no. Number one, cause that's not what the genocide convention actually prohibits. The genocide convention prohibits incitement, conspiracy, um, aiding and abetting, and, and so all those things are prohibited. And so we, we have, we can easily trigger yeah. the genocide convention. Number two, jurisprudence on this issue that's been documented in the International Criminal Tribunal in Yugoslavia and the International Criminal Tribunal in Rwanda most, you know, significantly have indicated that and in, a, in, in accordance with the genocide convention that destroying you know, destroying the conditions of life or attacking right. the conditions of life that are aimed at destroying a people's ability to survive is also genocide, right? And so we see that in jurisprudence, we see it in law. And so what people are, genocide is not just mass killings, which already exist. But right. when people like Chris Morgan and others say that if it was genocide, they would kill them all. What they're saying is that what annihilation? Yeah, we're not like we're, anything but that we're, is we're, is okay. Is this suggestion anything short anything of annihilation? But, yeah, right. What is the military? And then you get to war crimes, Katie. Like for those who just want to think about the laws of war, war, um, all war is regulated and based on two fundamental principles, as as customary law, which is the principle of distinction and the principle of proportionality. Right. You must distinguish between civilians and combatants, and you must use military force that is proportionate, that where the harm is proportionate to the military advantage achieved. We're on day 46. They have not destroyed Hamas. They have not extracted its soldiers or rescued the hostages. And so ostensibly, what is the military advantage that has been achieved? And they've not distinguished between civilians and combatants. They've been killing indiscriminately. 75% of those documented just on the face are women, children, and the elderly. Who were, This is not to absolve the killing of Palestinian men, but men, to say right. that we know on their face these are not combatants. Right? And so we have a violation of the principle of distinction, a violation, a, a disproportionate use of force, explicitly so. It is genocidal, Right? And it's based on a crisis of accountability for an ongoing apartheid regime. This is seeped, right? This is seeped in, in atrocity and violation um, that has been exceptionalized. That has been exceptionalized. And it's dangerous not just for Palestinians, obviously, whose lives are being stolen and whose futures are being stolen and trauma that's been created, right? Generational trauma, certainly, but this is dangerous for the whole world. Right. This is dangerous for the whole world. When a, when and if 
another country decides that it wants to use the, this kind of force against civilians in the name of security, they will be able to point to Israel. And that's how international law operates, through precedent and analogy. Anyway. Well, Nura, thank you so much. This has been amazing. Really, so appreciative of your time. And I'm glad you had a chance, and I wish that you were able to talk about stuff like this instead of having to try to argue the humanity of Palestinians, which is what hmm. I feel like people are forced to do when they are in mainstream media. Well, I'm I'm going to I'm going to echo what Palestinians um, have continued to say, which is we we are absolutely human and, and don't need to prove it to anybody. It's everyone else who is now apologizing for genocide that needs to prove that they are human because they have a crisis of humanity. Yeah. Amen to that. Yeah. Thanks, Katie. Appreciate you. Thank, Thank you. you for everything that you're doing. Thanks so much. And Nura's book is uh, Justice for Some. Law and the Question of Palestine, because people were asking. So we'll, and we'll link to that. All right. Wonderful. Okay. Great talking to you. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, you too. Bye. Bye-bye. All righty. So that was great. And so grateful to Nura for talking to us. And um, we are going to keep the show going. And thank you so much to everyone who's liked the stream. We've got a lot of likes and you're going to love our next guest. Um, and if you can haven't already liked it, please do like. And we are going to bring on Yako Shapiro, an international speaker, scholar and pulpit rabbi for 30 years now emeritus. Uh, after graduating high school at age 16, Rabbi Shapiro dedicated himself to full-time study of religion, becoming the protege of some of the most well-regarded rabbinic scholars in orthodoxy. He's written several books, and his most recent book is The Empty Wagon, Zionism's Journey from Identity Crisis to Identity Theft, a 1,381-page treaty on the differences between Judaism and Zionism. So without further ado, let us welcome to the show... Rabbi Yaakov Shapiro. Thank you for having me, Katie. Of Glad course, thank you here. for coming on. Yes, I um, I saw you taking notes during Nura's uh, presentation, <laughs> so I'm sure you have a lot to say. But I, I, I have an opening question, unless there's something that you want to to uh, to say. So, what is Zionism, and when did it start? <sighs> The definition of Zionism is something that no matter what you say, various Zionists are going to tell you, well, that's not Zionism. Zionists will tell you that Zionism is the right for the Jews to do this or that. But that's not what Zionism is. None of the founding fathers of Zionism said that. Rather than define Zionism in a way that you're going to be arguing about the definition, I would say that all Zionisms, no matter what type or who's giving the definition, presuppose two things. The first thing all Zionisms presuppose is that the Jewish people are a nationality. We're a nation. We're not just a religion, we're a nation. Now you can define a nation as a race, as they used to do in the olden days. You can define a nation however you want, but it's not just a religion, the way Jews looked at themselves for thousands of years. Jews are a nationality, and two, Israel is the state of that nationality. Those are the two things that are contained in all definitions of Zionism. Now, both of those are false and also anti-Semitic. First, I want to give a little introduction as to what Zionism is. Um, the topic is that I'm here tonight to discuss is why Zionism is anti-Semitic. And then I would like very much to submit a path forward for people right. to actually, something actionable that we could do. Perfect. Um, okay, so first, <laughs> Once upon a time, the Jewish people um, looked at themselves, well, let's go back 2,000 years when the days of the temple before the Romans kicked us out of uh, Jerusalem and uh, the Holy Land. The Jews looked at themselves as a people who were enjoined by God to fulfill the Torah. That's all they were. Um, the story of the Jewish people is very simple. It involves three things. God gave the Torah to the Jews. That's it. Those three things. God gave the Torah to the Jews. Any distortion of those three things, of I, any of those three things, uh, makes another religion. Uh, the ancient idol worshippers changed the def uh, changed the concept of God. They had you know, totem poles and things like that. That's why they were idol worshippers. The Christians changed the Torah. They have a New Testament. The law changed, and the Zionists changed the third factor there to the Jews. The Zionists changed the concept of what the Jews are, just as the pagans changed God and uh, monotheistic God, a first cause and uh, 
something that's completely unphysical into a totem pole and the christians added something to the law they completely changed the law they said it was superseded um the zionists changed the concept of the jewish people the concept of the jewish people used to be just as i said and it is succinctly uh stated by about a thousand years ago uh, rabbi sadja gon he lived in egypt and his statement was so well known that theodore herzl even quotes it in his diary without even knowing who said it he just quotes it it means in english we are only a people we're only united by the torah that's it nothing else unites us if you remove the torah from the jewish people there's no difference between the jews and anybody else Right. There were no bagels and locks even in those days. So there was absolutely no difference between the Jews and anybody else. Now, there are Jews in, back in the olden days that uh, didn't want to be Jews, and they perhaps converted to another religion. It was very unusual in those days to find a secular person all, at all, and certainly not anybody that identified as a secular Jew. It may be that Benedict Spinoza was a quirky exception. Depends who you ask. But then came the emancipation and the enlightenment and the Jews were no longer relegated to ghettos and they were allowed to go to universities and they were allowed to be out in society. And there were many Jews that said, you know what, I don't want to be religious. I don't want to be part of this um, studious, righteous, pious, uh, priestly kind of people. That's what the Jews were. Uh, we want to be regular Russians. We want to be regular Germans. We want to be regular Frenchmen. And that... The problem is it didn't work. Long story short, there were persecutions, uh, anti-Semitic persecutions against them. 1881, the pogroms in Russia started a, a cascade of terrible uh, pogroms that killed many, many Jews. And the, the secular Jews, the assimilated Jews had a kind of an identity crisis. Um, they didn't want to be Jews because they actually, and this is important to know, they looked at the Jews as ugly. It wasn't just that they didn't want to be religious because they wanted to, I don't know, talk on the telephone on, on Saturday. Rather, they looked at the Jews as ugly. I'm going to give you a, a couple of quotes over here. J Vladimir Jabotinsky, one of the early Zionists, one of the founding fathers of Zionism, who the Benjamin Netanyahu considers his mentor. He's really a mentor of his father, but he considers him a student of Jab himself, a student of Jabotinsky. Quote, I have no doubt that I am a Zionist because the Jewish people is a very nasty people and their neighbors hate it and they are right. Its end will be a Bartholomew night. Yosef Chaim Brenner, one of the big Zionist intellectuals, said, quote, if the tables were turned and others were like the Jews, wouldn't we have good cause to hate them as well? Uri Tzvi Gr Greenberg shares with us his opinion as to why religious Polish Jews uh, were persecuted, quote. Those loathsome Jews are vomited out by any healthy collective and state, not because they are Jews, but because of their Jewish repulsiveness. Ben-Gurion referred to Jews as parasites. Some statements by Adolf Hitler calling Jews parasites, and Ben-Gurion, it's hard to know who said which. They, they absorbed the attitudes of the anti-Semites. They didn't like the Jews, so they didn't want to be them. So no problem. You go assimilate, do what you want. The problem was the anti-Semites said to them, you know what? You're Jews, whether you like it or not. One Just, second. Sorry, Rabbi. Uh, is there, keep talking. There was something weird with your mic. S -s Talk again. Testing one, two, three. Brad, do you, do you hear that? Uh, did you move something? The mic is. Brad, you may have to come on and we may have to do a, a real time really? sound thing. Yeah. Just because this is too good for, I don't want to. Uh, hey, Rabbi, sorry to interrupt, um, and What's sorry, it? everyone. Would it be possible, Rabbi, to first thing, just to rejoin, and let's see if that solves it? Rejoin meaning? The, the stream yard, so leaving like we did earlier. Hopefully, that'll solve this. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> he did yeah. move it just then. Mm. I wonder if something came, became jostled. Yeah. I think, I think he's going to have to pull the cable, take it out, and put it back in. Yeah, I mean, hopefully uh, this will fix it. If not, uh, yeah, so sorry, if everybody. If not, just walk him in. Will you walk him through pulling the thing? Because, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, everyone. Uh, sorry, everyone. I know this is so good. All right, let's see. All right. Are we good? Yeah. T say something. Testing one, two, three. Yes, great. We're okay. good again. Perfect. Right. Okay. In here, my earphones sound good. Anyway, so they, 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 
Russians and the Germans and the French told the assimilated Jews basically, you're Jewish and we're going to persecute you anyway as you're Jewish. Now they, now they had a, a resultant identity crisis. They said, well, we don't want the identity of the Jews, but they won't let us have the identity of the Gentiles. So what do we do? There are various different theories. The theory of Zionism was the dominant one, and that's the one that, uh, dom that, that's the one that ended up successful at the end. The theory of Zionism was we're going to change the Jews from a religion into a nationality. The problem is that the, and the nationalism was a, a big thing in those days, and it helped a lot of people, like people from the Balkan states, and it was like a big thing. Every hundred years, there's you know another thing, another ism. Natu nationalism was a thing going on. Those things. So that's going to be the cure for the Jews. Once the Jews become nationals, and once they become like normal people, like nationals, that was in those days what normal people were considered. Uh, that was considered normal people. There won't be any more anti-Semitism. No one's going to hate them. Everyone's going to love them. They won't. Everything will be fine. The problem is the Jews were not a nationality. They had no characteristics of a nation. No land. No no common land, language, or culture. Jews are from many lands. They spoke many languages, and they have many cultures. They still do to this day. They had no flag. They had no national anthem. There wasn't even a symbol of the Jews. The Star of David was not really a symbol of the mm -hmm. Jews. It is a religious symbol, but it, it, it's not the symbol of the Jews. It doesn't have any holiness. You're allowed to throw it in the garbage. It, it is meaningful. It, there are a lot of different explanations, the simplest being that it points up, down, into the four corners of the earth. It represents God. Mm. I mean, it's all over, right? Up, down, and four, north, south, east, west. That's, that's what it represents, a three-dimensional compass. That, that's all. And the Jews, everything about the Jews is just a relationship to God. So... The Zionists wanted to change that. Uh, they wanted to fix the Jews. The Jews were disgusting. They're going to make them better. The way they're going to make them better is by giving them national characteristics. So uh, there's, uh, by way of analogy, let's say I wanted to change the Christians into baseball players. And not, I didn't want to convince them, you know, give up your Christianity, become a baseball player, because they probably won't cooperate What I would uh, do better, what I would prefer to do is to convince the Christians that they always were baseball players, that Jesus was like the founder of the baseball league, and they always were baseball players. And these things, this religion business and God and, and Trinity and Jesus and Messiahs, that's all stuff that got messed up. You got messed up. That's not real Christianity. And, and what I would do is I would give the Christians bats and balls to play with. I would make them pinstripe uniforms that says Christians across the chest, give them a stadium to play in and say now you're the real christians if you have a good education starting from little kids and you bring them up this way before you know it in a generation or two uh, christians were always supposed to be baseball players and this religion stuff was just nonsense that they they got into their head once upon a time and that's what the zionists wanted to do to the jews let's give them a language so they created modern hebrew jews haven't spoken modern hebrew and there was no modern hebrew to speak right. uh, the hebrew language the ancient hebrew language has a, a few hundred uh, root words. It's not a speakable language. Um, even when we did speak it, it wasn't the national language of the Jewish people, meaning that's not what united us into a nationality the way other languages do. So we're going to make modern Hebrew. And they had modern Hebrew before they had a state. Uh, it was not an easy thing, but they did it. Uh, easier was to make a flag. They made their Israeli flag. It was there before Israel was. Um, they made a culture. They changed their names from European names to Middle Eastern sounding names. The hardest thing for them to get was a country, which they finally got as well. And the idea is we're going to teach the Jews that the Jews are always a nationality. Your aspirations to return to the Holy Land was not for a messianic renewal of the world, a new spiritual revelation of God where the wolf will lay down with the lamb. No, really, it's a political self-determination that you always wanted. And that's why they chose Israel as opposed to everywhere else. The Zionists could have had land in many, many places. There was Uganda plan, Argentina, various different places, but they turned that down because they figured in order to get the Jews to cooperate, in order to formulate this gaslighting, that's what it was, to educate the Jews, they had to fit their own... <laughs> They, they had to lend artificial Jewish flavoring and artificial Jewish coloring to their completely non-Jewish movement. So they took the old Jewish aspirations, this, as we say in our prayers, next year in Jerusalem. And we, they say, oh, well, you know what we meant always? What we meant was we're going to have national self-determination in Jerusalem. That's not what we ever meant. And I'll tell you a secret, um, Katie, that they don't tell you. The people in Jerusalem today also say next year in Jerusalem. 
And the reason they say it is because the Jerusalem that we're praying for is not the Jerusalem that exists today. It's it's a, a concept, more of a place. It's in a place, but it's nothing like what we have today. All everything about Judaism is spiritual: God, angels, law, miracles, Moses, splitting of the sea. That's Ju that's Judaism. They wanted to take Judaism and change it into a political thing, a political identity. That's right. Zionism. And 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 really the goal of Zionism, the ultimate goal of Zionism is to purify the Jews and to rehabilitate the Jews and to rebrand the Jews such that instead of being people like me, which everybody hates because they've had anti-Semitism throughout the centuries, people are going to become like Benjamin Netanyahu or Ariel Sharon, who everybody loves, right? That was their plan didn't work out that way, but that was their plan. They're going to win gold medals. They're going to win Eurovision contests. They're going to be normal people. They're going to have an army. And of course, that was the main thing that they hated about the Jews. Right. The Jews are big pacifists. They ran rather than fought. We don't fight. We don't like wars. We don't like fighting. Uh, we, we, we don't have places, uh, you know, like the Alamo is a place of a battle. We don't even have, we have all over the Old Testament, there are battles and wars all over the place, but there is no holy site of a war. We don't have any such places. Uh, I was on another uh, show a while ago and somebody in the comments later said, what do you mean? What about Masada? Yeah. Masada is a Zionist invention. Masada meant nothing to the Jews for this very reason. It was the site of a bunch of bar yonim there. They were uh, thugs, actually. They were kicked out of Jerusalem by the rabbis, and they hold uh, themselves up in that fortress. We, it was nothing to us. A uh, guy, uh, some couple of Zionists, archaeologists, they decided to create these type of things, and that's exactly what the Zionists did. They made a new Jewish history. They made a new Jewish uh, personality and new Jewish, new Jewish aspirations and everything. And that's Zionism. And their goal is, their goal was, it was like a supersessionist uh, religion where they say, we're the real Jews. You know, plenty of people say they're the real Jews. They're the black Hebrews that say they're the real Jews. There's Christian supersessionists say the real Jews, but with the Zionists, it is different. I say the Orthodox Jews are the uh, real authentic type Jews and everybody else is in violation. Okay. Everybody uh -oh. says that. Don't worry about it. Uh, you, the we'll work it, it out it later. Yeah. It will yeah. work it out. It is what it is, Katie. However, however, these guys did something different that nobody, nobody, none of the Jewish deviant movements ever did. And actually no country in the world ever did. They said that, you know what? We're not saying that we're the real Jews and the Orthodox are not, although there are those who have said it. Uh, rather, we are the representative of all the Jews in the world. Jews are a nationality, whether you're religious or you're not religious, whether you're uh, a black Hebrew or a, a, a if, or a uh, Jew for Jesus, whatever they want to say. But we are the state of those Jews. All those Jews comprise a nationality. And just like in the United States of America, there are people of different races, different cultures and things. But there's a country. With, they are Israel is the country of the Jews. OK, now it's important to know that there's no country in the world that does this. Every single country in the world is the country of their citizens, meaning here in the United States of America, everybody in the United States of America came from somewhere unless you're a Native American. My family's from Poland. Everybody came from somewhere. We're less than 300 years old, but we're all Americans. A person comes to America, they become a citizen, they live the, the life of an American, and eventually they assimilate into a, a, they become American. Same thing with Italy. They become Italians and France. You become French. In Israel, there's a, by Israeli law, there is no Israeli nationality. There's only a Jewish nationality. There's Israeli citizenship, but no Israeli nationality. Israel's nation state law says that only Jews have the right to self-determination in Israel. Nobody else. And this means two things. Thing number one, that I, uh, a Jew of Polish descent who never lived in Israel, don't plan on living on in Israel, have nothing to do with Israel, don't want anything to do with Israel, they claim that they're my state. Benjamin Netanyahu says that he's my prime minister. Um, that that's what they think that they are the leaders of the jews and they say it's all over the place now uh, to the point where jonathan pollard actually now this is completely anti-semitic absolutely anti-semitic this is the dual loyalty trope to the point where jonathan pollard do we have that article Katie? uh yeah do we have that brad um hold on it was in the email mm -hmm. um if not let me just there's a link uh, to yeah. the jerusalem post hold on one second, I can just open it. Sorry about that. Um, sent mm, Shapira. Da, da, da. 
Okay. I'll open that. Share screen. Sorry about this delay. Okay. All right. Scroll down. Pollard, Jews will always have dual loyalty and should consider spying for Israel. Jonathan Pollard said that he would actually advise young Jews to spy for Israel. American Jews to spy on America against America for Israel. Now, this is an absolute anti-Semitic dual loyalty trope. And but he that, was a spy. He was a spy. Just for yes, people he was, who don't know who he is. He, yeah. he was a spy for Israel. He was convicted and uh, he served his sentence and uh, moved to Israel. And now he's a hero over there. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, he's a villain. He spied on his own country for money, actually. But uh, Israel, the Zionists say, well, he saved a lot of lives. He didn't save a lot of lives. He actually put American lives in Russia at risk. And you know, Israel has a tendency to do that, to justify things by saying it's necessary for saving lives. But that's what Jonathan Pollard says. Israel claims to be my state. There is no other country hair, in the too. world. What? Bad hair also, less Bad offensive, hair. though, less problematic, yeah. There is, there is no other country in the world that claims to be the state, the nation state of people that have nothing to do with it, never had anything to do with it, citizens of other countries. And, and you know, and it's not that I come from Israel, that I'm an Israeli-American. My family's from Poland. You know, Germany, there are Germans in America that Germany does not demand their allegiance at all, but uh, they still came from Germany. I never came from Israel. We have nothing to do with it. There is not a single country in the world like that. But the second thing that that means, the flip side of that, is that if you're not Jewish and you're an Israeli citizen, Israel is not your country. Let me repeat that. You can move to Israel, be a loyal Israeli citizen, serve in its army, do whatever it tells you to do for generations, for hundreds of years. You could be Israeli and perfectly Israeli, speak Hebrew with a perfect Israeli act. But guess what? Israel is not your country because you're not Jewish. Now, here's the question. Well, what does being Jewish mean to the Israelis? It's not my definition of Jewish. And the answer is they have never defined what a Jew is. Ben-Gurion said there is no definition of a Jew. That's Those were his words. If that's true, though, how does somebody know if they're Jewish, if there's no definition? Jabotinsky said Jews are a race. Other people said that Jews are some kind of tribe, even though they're not. Um, they have no official definition of Jew, and therefore they have no official definition of Jewish state. Ben-Gurion said that nowadays, the Knesset, Israel's parliament, actually has the right to determine who is a Jew and who is not. And Israeli law says that even if you don't believe in God and you're not religious, you're still entitled to the law of return because you're Jewish. But if you were born Jewish and you believe in Christianity or you practice Islam, you believe Muhammad is a prophet or that Jesus is the Messiah, you're not a Jew and you're not entitled to the law of return. Now, that's a contradiction. It makes no sense. If the Jew, Jew, if you're born Jew, if it's some racial type thing, what difference is it? What religion you practice? And if you can be an atheist, that you don't believe in any God and any Messiah and any prophet, that's okay. But if you believe in Jesus as the Messiah or Muhammad as the prophet or some other type of religion, you're not Jewish enough for them. And it's all arbitrary. That's the thing with Zionism. They they're arbitrary there it's contradictory the whole thing doesn't make sense now how did it work the way it worked it is through propaganda the way it worked is through tremendous propaganda there's the holocaust and not only it's not a question of holocaust denial in every town in this country katie where there are jews there's a holocaust memorial there aren't yeshivas in every town but there has to be a Holocaust memorial. A Pew survey not a number of years ago asked what's most essential to Judaism, what's essential to Judaism to you. And the thing that came in first place was remembering the Holocaust. Now, of course, remember the Holocaust. Of course, there are lessons of the Holocaust. But Zionists made it front and center of Jewish identity. It became part of their identity. Yeah. Okay, now, now, like Norman that, Finkelstein's book, The Holocaust Industry. Yes, oh, I yeah. call it in my book, The Church of the Holocaust God. And it's it became part of their identity. Now, a Newsweek reporter named Alsop once told Golda Mayer that he thinks she has a Masada complex because it's they're, they're traumatized, these Zionists. And uh, she said, yes, we have a Masada complex and we have a Holocaust complex and a pogrom complex. The thing is that most people consider their complex as something to get rid of. They go to therapists for that. But to the Zionists, this is literally their identity. 
And because they don't have the traditional Jewish identity, the one that I identify with, they need to fill that gap with something. They have to fight and die for things and kill for things. And this, this Holocaust identity and this nationality identity, and it's all emotion and it's, it's, it doesn't stay the same. They still haven't defined what a Jew is or uh, it doesn't matter. There's a Holocaust. It doesn't matter what a Jew is. We'll think about all this later. You had a lawyer on and she was talking about law and international law. But what good after we get rid of the Hitlers and the, the Hitler du jour, we'll, we'll, after we're safe, everybody wants to kill us. There was a hit song in Israel once called The whole world is against us. It was an actual song, a hit song in Israel. Everybody wants to kill us. We got to get rid of First, we got to be safe. Then we'll worry about all these technicalities. Mm -hmm. And it keeps running and running and running like that. And it, it, it changes its arguments from one day to the next. And if, you, and if you think that the actual identity theft to steal the Jewish identity is no longer their goal, I have a book over here happen to have it's called winning the war of words by Anat Wilf. Okay. I once had a conversation with her and um, it was supposed to be a debate, but she didn't want to call it a debate uh, for good reason. And in any case, so she says that Zionism continuously changes its story. On page 98, the next frontier of Zionist inclusion is adapting the story to fit Christians, ultra Orthodox Jews, and ultimately Muslims. We're all going to be part of the Zionist story. The Orthodox Jews, the Zionist story will be rewritten as to make so as to make ultra-Orthodoxy, that's me, into another gen, equally genuine form of Zionism. The 2,000-year-long continuing existence of ultra-Orthodox communities in the holy cities of Jerusalem, Hevron, Svas, and Tiberia, for example, may be portrayed as having paved the way for modern Zionism and secured the path for the return of the Jewish people to their homeland. They want to make me into a Zionist. That's the goal. But uh, it's not just me. They want to make the Muslims and the Arabs into Zionists too and rewrite history so that everybody lives happily ever after. They, they, they're, you know, I don't want to say shapeshifter because that's that's a, uh, people trope. say it's a, it's a trope. So it's like, trope, right? so instead, uh, it's like a, um, Chameleon? T a T-1000 Terminator. Okay. OK, you, you can't grab it. They keep changing. They keep changing their story. They say themselves they do this right now. And, and that's why they insist that anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. Netanyahu wrote in his book and Avigdor Lieberman has an article on Israel's own website. You know, we have .gov. They also have the same type of thing. Israel's Minister of Foreign, Ministry of Foreign Affairs website and um, Danny Ayalon said it, and even Ben Shapiro, no relation to me, thank God, yeah. uh, also said it. He's, they said the following. Uh, if you, you want to know what Zionism is in a nutshell, by the way, this is a very good formulation. They said anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism, meaning that if you believe Israel should not exist, you're an anti-Semite, and here's why. Japan is to the Japanese, but France is to the French, what Israel is to the, finish that uh, equation. It should be what Israel is to the Israelis. Right, but it's not. But but it, with, that's without Zionism. With Zionism, France is to the French, what Japan is to the Japanese, what Israel is to the Jews. Now, and just as you can't say, I want, I'm in favor of having a Japanese people, but I don't want Japan to exist. You can't say that. I, I'm in favor, favor of having, having a French identity in the people without France. So too, you cannot say, I'm in favor of having Jewish identity without Israel. That's Zionism. That's what they uh, want you to say. That's yes. what they want you to think. Yeah. That's what they want you to think. And that's why anti-Zionism to them is anti-Semitism. And it's the conflation of Jews and Zionism. So we can all agree. I think we have enough people that agree. I don't have to convince anybody that Judaism is not Zionism. And conflating the two is anti-Semitic. There are two types of people that conflate Jews with Zionists. Zionists conflate Judaism with Zionism. Anti-Semites do it in order to delegitimize Judaism by claiming that it's Zionism, and Zionists do it in order to legitimize Zionism by claiming it's Judaism. Thank you so much. Please come back, though, because I have will. a lot more questions. Thanks. Okay. That was great. Wow. Fascinating discussion. So much to think about. I didn't know it was going to go in that direction. Uh, that was fun. Um, interesting. All right. Uh, that was a fun debate. Let's see. Yeah, we will bring him back on. Very interesting. I, 
my brain is, I guess my, the, my, my anti-Zionism is more motivated by S S Palestinian. Let me think. I have to think about this. I have to reflect on this. This is real time questioning. Maybe you should make this Patreon. Um, not because I'm afraid of it. I want to release it, but it's good. We haven't had Patreon in a while. And I think we should, Brad, what do you think? What if we make this a delay Patreon that we release like after a week or something? Cause I don't, yeah. Cause I don't think that this is, um, this is interesting, but it's not going to, um, convince anyone to help, to help. In other words, the part of the reason I want things to be not Patreon lately is because I want to make sure we get out the news. And this is a very interesting discussion, but it's not going to save the lives of Palestinians per se. So I don't feel the same pressure because that's the kind of anti-Zionist I am. No, I, I agree. And I also, you know, not to, you know, just blow smoke here, Katie, but um, I can't recall another instance on like your mainstream news where I've, I can't recall a pundit ever being like, I need to think about this for right. a while. Yeah. And like, and I, I agree, like I, I, it's so much to take in that I can't speak absolutely on what I think and everything, but I just think that that speaks to how awesome the conversation was. Yeah. That it's something that I have to think about because a lot of the time I very quickly like know what I'm thinking and everything right. and yeah, really appreciated and I discussion. Yeah. And I also feel like I've been told by people, thank you for what you're doing. I don't mean this in a self uh congratulating way. Sure. But I think I think it makes it easier for anti-Zionists who are not Jewish to be surrounded by to not be the to not have it so that the only anti-Zionists are not Jewish voices. I think it is right. a good buffer. Right. No, I, I agree. Like, and it, I was thinking, and again, I might evolve on this, but I was just thinking like in the short term here and now, yes, I can see the utility in that. But long term, big picture, I also see what he's saying right. too. And that's something that, again, that's what I yeah. need to like think about to like square in my own head. But someone said, I do think it's dangerous to d disengage as Jewish allies. Your Palestinian comrades have vocalized their support in the wake of smear campaigns. I. I'm not going to, that's not, that's not what I'm thinking about. Right. I'm thinking about, um, like what the long-term effect, I guess to right. me, to me, it's clear that there, like I said, this is triage. Like the immediate goal is yeah. to stop the literal massacre of Palestinians. So I'll do whatever yeah. it takes. And I don't, I don't know if this makes sense. It was just a random thought that I had, uh, written a few minutes ago, but I was thinking aloud, like maybe there's some utility in using your Jewishness in opposing what Israel is doing simply because uh, Israel and the powers that be are using Jewishness right. to justify or, you know, excuse everything that Israel is doing. Right. But then that's kind of like fighting fire with fire. And I don't know if that yeah. makes sense. I don't know. I don't know. So we have a really condescending person in the comments, but oh, I don't awesome. think I'm going to highlight their comment. Yeah, don't. Someone thinks that I lack understanding. Oh. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. All right. Um, I shouldn't even. Uh, yeah. But it is an interesting uh, yeah. question. But I do care more about Palestinians than I do. I mean, there is some self-interest in this, too, in that I don't want Israel when it commits heinous crimes. The sure. first level is I. this is as a as a person. And look, I'm, I'll be real. When I say as a Jew, that's also propagandistic. I'm, I'm totally honest about that. Sure. I mean, it's true. Yeah. My Jewish, my Jewish um, identity was very much founded on never again for anyone. And yeah. I would argue that historically speaking, the reason there is a... Uh, hold on one second. Let me just ban some people from the chat. Okay. Historically speaking, I think that um, part of the reason that there is a tradition of leftist, internationalist, secular Jews is because of anti-Semitism and because of a diaspora tradition and because not having a state, ironically, 
um, that lends itself to internationalism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but I, I do think that to me, the most important thing is if I were, if I were Buddhist, I would say as a Buddhist, stop what Israel is doing. Mm -hmm. But I, I do feel like then after that level, and that's the first level, right? is the, I don't want, while Israel does heinous things that will increase anti-Semitism, I want the world to know that not all Jews, I don't right. want to be a moving target for right. anti-Zionists. Right, 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 right. Um. So yeah, all interesting things. I understand yeah. where he's coming from, but yeah, um, right. Yeah. Anyway, but um, but I do think. Look, the truth is, I know that people appreciate it when Jews, because the more Jews criticize Israel, the harder it is to portray anti-Zionism right. as anti-Semitism, right. and the easier we're making the lives of people who are, um out there right. and vulnerable again and, like yeah. in, again in the short term because you know just talking about like u.s mainstream media traditionally speaking yeah. it seems like when people speak out like that the go-to reply would be you know you're an anti-semite or blah blah right. blah and then having someone who is jewish doing that or leading that at least potentially hopefully makes that smear more difficult or not effective though still doesn't take away from me not seeing what he's saying in the larger picture. Right. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, but I'm super glad that he said he would be coming back because yeah. yeah, it's really yeah. interesting. Yeah. Finkelstein Shapiro discussion would be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway. And I'm so happy that we finally unraveled the mystery of what was going on with his yeah. microphone. <laughs> right. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Um, uh, I mean, I also disagree with him on what makes a Jew. Mm. That's another thing. Mm. So, you know, um, but I definitely enjoy talking to him. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. And then, yeah, I want to talk to him next time about uh, Christian Zionism, because that's really interesting. It's a lot older than people think. It's not just recent. It's a lot older. Um, yeah. All right. Well, guys, this has been great. And um, the, we have you're definitely going to want to join Patreon people who aren't watching live because we have a really fascinating discussion with some comedic interludes of uh, tech difficulties <laughs> with Rabbi uh, Yaakov Shapiro, who will come back onto the show. But um, uh, this has been great. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Thank you, everyone, for liking. Um, have a, a super chats. Thank you for thank the super you so chats. Much. Yes. I didn't get to all of them because I wanted to make sure to bring on the guest and um, what else? Um, but thank you here. Uh, thank you so much for the super chat people. Uh, Yabbits, Rain Burroughs, um, Wade Worth. Oh, bye, Brad. Firmware. When have you heard the phrase Palestinians have a right to defend themselves? Very rarely. Uh, do not have for it to be okay to advocate a supremacist ethno state. Did not have for it to be okay to advocate for suppressed ethno say on my bingo card for 2023. I don't know. It's been like that for a while, but certainly among self uh, described leftists, no. Um, uh, according to Daniel Boyerin in the No State Solution, the fathers of Zionism never wanted to stay for Israel, but for a Jewish autonomous region. I don't know that book. I'll look into that. Um, thank you for becoming a new member, Ardor Turk. Um, from where Katie, I've written a poem for Gaza. Please read and forward to Noor Yaakov if appropriate. Okay, I guess send it to me on Patreon. Um, Kyle Willis, thank you for the super sticker. Israeli is, Israel is condemning itself. Ask Noor any comments on Osama, oh, Osama letter USA. All right, next time she's on. Although I, I'm kind of glad I didn't ask her that because it's, yeah. Super curious what Ms. Is, it's, it's Ms. Ericott's opinion is on Bernie Sanders' strange uh, stance against ceasefire. Uh, how will they fill up their skin bank without the Palestinians help cancer surgery? Uh, YouTube was blocking for super chats. I don't think so from where maybe, or maybe I just wasn't highlighting them. Someone said great speech, Nora, Katie, please show us Nora's book and title. It's um, justice for some, the question of law and the question of Palestine. Um, have not found tunnels, right? They haven't. 
first Nura, now Rabbi Shapiro. This is an amazing show. I'm so happy we got Rabbi Shapiro. His book on Empty Wagon is amazing. I asked him that. Thank you for the super sticker. This is why the Founding Fathers want separation of church and state. Thank you for the membership super sticker. Cool. Um, Shalom, Rabbi Yaakov Shapiro. I just purchased your book, The Empty Wagon, through Amazon. We'll get your book this Friday. Do you have a WhatsApp? Uh, okay. Half. I doubt he was going to share the WhatsApp publicly, but maybe if you email me on Patreon, uh, I can uh, forward it. Man, he's dismantling the state of Israel. P please or thank you, sign. Thank you, Steve McNally, for that super chat. Only Judaism can debunk Zionism. Thank you for the super chat. Uh, I, Rabbi Shapiro, don't the Palestinians refer to Zionist enemy? We did most clarifying. Why does MSM bring on dips like Rabbi Shmuley instead of amazing, knowledgeable people like ben Rabbi Shapiro? Um, MK Pal Blick Jews in, with the same rights than all equal. Um, Katie, I can't match the guest talk to this pain. Tell Roger we are uncomfortable with MSM misleadership, class numbness. Love you idiotically. China should lease Gaza in the way England lease Hong Kong. And the Troy Ben super sticker. Well, guys, thank you so much for coming to the show. It's been great. And um, have a great problematic holiday. Some people take off this week, but not us. We work in protest of this holiday. Um, or maybe we're just, some of us aren't traveling. Um, okay. Uh, thank you, Brad. Thank you, T Tyler. Thank you, Phantom Fanta. And thank you to all the guests, all the viewers that are super chatters. And do go to patreon.com slash the Katie Halper Show for a great segment where um, Rabbi Yaakov Shapiro and I debate anti-Zionism. Bye, everyone. Okay, calm down.